But yeah, the university is making a lot of money from us. I'm convinced of it. My wife has figured that it's roughly uh, a quarter. My annual income is roughly a quarter of what uh, a new tenure track um, professor would be for the work that I do. 60 papers, two times about 60 exams at Xavier alone. I like teaching. I think it's got a lot of rewards, a lot of challenges. My goal is to be a, a person who can reach students um, and who can give them an appreciation for the field. That and I enjoy teaching. I enjoy knowledge. I enjoy uh, discussion. I enjoy intellectualizing history in particular. I love the mental stimulation of asking questions and, for example, having students look at things in a new way. I love to see, uh, to, to feel um, crusts around brains softening and, and crinkling. Um, 70, 60, 70 papers, all to be turned around in about, in about a week or two. We have this one course, freshman English, that is required of all students, no matter what their majors are. So there's, what is it, two or three thousand freshmen are taking this course every year, year in and out, year in and year out. It's the hardest course in English to teach by far because it's a required course. Few of the students want to take it. The, uh, the paper uh, grading load is very heavy. It's really very cruel. Uh, so uh, full-time faculty disdain teaching the course. They hate it. They don't want to teach it. So it's shoved off onto the adjuncts. And Hearing a rumor that the head of my department at one school said, um, adjuncts don't matter, <laughs> even though we're taking the brunt of the, the load of students who come through that department or who introduce them to this field of study, um, I think is a callous remark to make. The adjunct faculty uh, are, are so poorly paid, uh, often they have to cobble uh, three or four jobs together at different institutions and uh, they become uh, uh, freeway faculty, uh, moving from one campus to the other. So this doesn't work in the interest of the student. It doesn't work in the interest of the full-time faculty. It's very exploitive of the part-time faculty because uh, just to make ends meet, they have to spend more and more of their time uh, working at different institutions. This means they have less time to engage in scholarship, less time to engage in research. There's more important things to do in class than to explain to them the problems of adjuncting. But I explained it to them in t with regard to what is important to them. <coughs> so be beyond that, I just don't make this a big issue. Mm -hmm. I simply don't, I do not want to get the impression that I'm just some kind of, some kind of not quite real faculty. You know? Well, let's see, at one school, um, we don't have a telephone in the office in that department. So the secretary, if she's taking a message for me, has to run down the hall from the main office and see if I'm in. Frequently, of course, students call when I'm not there uh, and they leave a message and sometimes messages are misplaced or, of course, for example there, since I only teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays, a message will come in on Thursday afternoon and a student will come to me on Tuesday in a panic and say, did you get my message? And I, of course, haven't. Office space ranges from sharing my office with three other adjunct members and sometimes four to not even having an office, just a couch. Most of my work is done at home. Um, due to the, the fact that I don't have, you know, a, a formal office, um, most, of, most of my work is done either in a faculty lounge or, or out of a, a bag that I carry with me. In one case, I share my desk with three other people, so I have to label which drawers okay. are mine. In the ideal world, well, in the hopefully not so distant future, I hope to get a full-time tenure-track job with benefits, a teaching load of less than six classes, which, which is what I'm doing more or less this year, benefits, hopefully tenure one day, and sabbaticals, access to research grants, the chance to one day actually retire. We have just a little over 1,900 um, full-time faculty. And we have over 1,200 part-time faculty. 
Um, and that would go up to, could go up to close to 2,000, depending on if you look at some other ways that part-time faculty are uh, classified at the university. As I see it in this universe, there are really three reasons why you would use part-time or adjunct faculty. Uh, the first reason is because they bring a special kind of expertise, an expertise that you can't afford in the form of a full-time dedicated faculty member. Uh, using adjunct or part-time faculty also enable a department to make modest adjustments in its staffing of courses over time. The third reason is probably the one that I respect the least of the three, and that is a purely economic reason where it's really a response to a lack of funding or, in, in truth, in some cases where an administration has decided to spend the dollars available for instruction in other areas. The danger of adjunct faculty is where they're being used in place of full-time faculty, where there is both, where there is ample demand for a full-time hire in an area, but it's simply cheaper and gives more centralized power to administrative bodies not to hire on a full-time basis. What I see out there coming from the administration is that their values are solely for profit. They don't care about education. Clearly the value of education is like, who, if we can make money out of it, okay, otherwise forget it. Or get and the more, PR out of it. Well, I, I or PR, more important, right, on paper. What, what I find myself comparing um, uh, myself to with regard to the, the, the film or the video is, is the, in, the, the value of the dignity of the individual, the importance of, of, of being human, uh, the worth of the individual person, respect for the individual person. But don't um, we see the opposite in our situations? I mean, yes. we're not people or teacher, we're positions. Well, and anybody can fill that position, anybody and can. I question, oh, and I from question, them, everybody's interchangeable. Uh, I, I, the I only thing you. I ask part-time faculty to do is to teach the class, to properly prepare the class, to meet the class on time, to keep them for the entire class period, and to meet every class. And if, for some reason, a part-time faculty member cannot be on board, I expect them to get someone else to cover the class. It seems uh, to maybe I'll... ideally you'd like to run with full-time faculty because you get more service in a way out of them. The existence of the adjunct faculty means there are uh, fewer full-time faculty members to be involved in uh, the governance of the university, reflecting faculty views uh, on the faculty senate, on the various committees, uh, reflecting the views. A full-time faculty member, they, they teach, they do advising, they're involved in research and scholarship, they're involved in service, so it's, it's a more complete contribution. As you ask part-time faculty to do more than merely teach, they are now beginning to take on the mantle of looking like tenure-track faculty. If I ask One of the things we've done this last year is to establish some minimum salaries uh, for part-time faculty. We've also put a promotion uh, structure into place so that faculty uh, who, who are part-time can, um, after a certain number of quarters, can be reviewed and be promoted so that they could go from adjunct instructor to adjunct assistant professor. So there's an adjunct career ladder of a sort. It doesn't provide either the pay advantage or the uh, security of a tenure track, but it is at least prestige and increased income. What I fear is that long term we may not exist at all, and that what's happening now with part-time faculty might be described as a case of the camel getting its nose in the flap of the tent. That we're hiring part-time faculty on a contract basis to teach a course. And that's what Bill Gates would do. Uh, that's what GE University would do or Hamburger U or any business, any institution of higher education associated with a business. Should the university per, uh, perpetuate this, uh, this, this extreme kind of exploitation? I mean, the university, I think, should be more respons responsive to, to uh, taxpayers and, and public opinion because it's supported uh, by public taxes. And frankly, the guy and the people who run this place run it as a kind of I think they must think of themselves as, as I don't know, industrial uh, giants or something.
And that is exactly the, the image there you go. that the university minister. president and higher ups are, are adopting. They want to become this very exclusive, highly paid CEO corporate. You know, the, the university as a corporation, and, and it is that paradigm that is, you know, has really fostered um, hiring adjuncts because adjuncts pay the way. I mean, we, we teach all the university undergraduate students, the undergraduates are paying more for less. Only if I have always liked the fact that our department had a relatively high percentage of part-time faculty because many of them brought to the classroom and to our students an, a kind of expertise that the, real, the college really couldn't afford to bring to them. But once you get outside of our department, I have very serious reservations about how well served the students are in the programs in our department when they take an English course taught by part-time faculty, when, when virtually every course they take is taught by part-time faculty. What flavor of the institution did they take with them when they walked out of here with their degree? I would say in some places, like in English and Romance languages and perhaps in, in a math department, it's primarily the first-year courses that are taught by part-time faculty. And to some extent, there's some effort to move away from that because the idea of to try to get the full professors with your first-year students is a really very positive experience. I guess if the truth be told, there are several courses I would prefer that full-time fac that only full-time faculty teach, uh, but that's not always possible. Sometimes we just don't have the availability of full-time faculty to teach those classes. But again, budgets and resources just don't allow that, that ideal situation um, to happen. I think, I think people are shocked when they hear about it, particularly in the context of tuitions going up. Boy, tuitions are going up. Where's all that money going? If I'm getting 6% of the money that's coming to the class, just 6%, where's that other 94% going, for God's sake? Administrations have always linked any pittance that they throw at us um, to exorbitant um, tuition hikes. Our students at yeah. Rutgers are getting ready to, or have been hit with, with, a, with a new tuition hike, and yet who is teaching the undergraduates? It's the cheap hires. That's right. It's you and I. It's, it's adjuncts and TAs that are teaching all the undergraduate so courses. Happening? We are the cheap hires, but, the, but the, the undergraduate is being forced to carry a larger and larger part of the budget. They've got to pay for our president's limo. They've got to pay for our football stadium. They've got to pay for all these other things which don't have anything to do with education but have to do with certain particular people making money and using the university as a site to make money that really has got nothing to do with education. So is that but, but our future um, uh, depends as much on the future of the regular faculty. I mean, we're not separate. We're not in, in opposition. We're really basically together. And one of the ways they destroy unions is to, you know, divide and conquer. You seem to suggest that uh, we should feel we're in the same boat with regular faculty. I, I never experienced it that way myself. No. no. Why I not? think they got it made in the shade. Even if they have it made in the shade, their self-interest in uniting with us is protecting their positions that we're going to replace. You know, as a union, we have a, a pretty good relationship with a full-time faculty as well. It's these people out here who are really operating a business for profit under the guise of a kind of non-profit education that, that, are, that, are, that are setting this up and, and abusing and exploiting us for profit. I don't, I don't think there's any two ways about it. No, and and um, it's that whole kind of mindset that, that really we need, to, we need to deal with and we need to, we need to fight. If our 35 to 45 part-time faculty were to form a union and say, we demand higher pay, I would simply hire another 35 or 45 part-time faculty because I can get them. Uh, I have a file drawer full of resumes. I have a nice thick stack. If there were some kind of union organizing activity among part-time faculty, um, there might be some moral suasion put into place. If they began picketing at the university, it might put a bad face on the university, but it wouldn't, frankly, it wouldn't stunt my operation one bit. And that doesn't mean that I'm not in favor of unionizing activity, even though I teach business. Uh, I have always taught students a lesson that I learned from one of my graduate faculty many, many years ago. He always said that companies got unions that deserved unions. The 
smallness of minds that occupy some of the associate dean's offices in the schools who deal with whether or not we pay for our own parking uh, in, a, in a deck at Newark or, or get a free lot, uh, who determine whether or not we get a space of a, a fourth of a carol or not uh, to see students. They're the ones who are really, they're getting dicta from somewhere. Yes. And the only way we're going to be able to combat it is to get the, the dicta changed. Uh, these small minds will, will work in a positive way if they're told to. Adjunct professors have not made their argument to the state that I am aware of. It, in such a manner, if they have, it is such a manner that uh, it's fallen on deaf ears because they're not organized. In the state that I'm working, um, legislation is enacted that makes it very hard for me to um, approach labor unions um, or to be able to have a union represent me in bargaining my contract or in getting any other benefits. Um, now, other states are fortunate enough to have some labor organizing, and I think that would be a real boon to adjuncts. In most legislative uh, arenas, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And until adjuncts or part-time workers at universities decide that the squeaky wheel needs some oil, then their dilemma will continue. I, I think this needs to be said. It's, it's um, that we're, in a sense, a privileged class compared to Marvin workers. Yes. And, and it's like, who are we to complain? That was my first reaction. But well, then again, no, then no again, there are parallels, and there's, there's, yeah. there's issues of yeah. well, exploitation of labor and, and un, inadequate compensation and protection. And, uh, those are legitimate parallels. I think as, as an adjunct, I have more in common with, with my part-time uh, brothers in other industries than I have with a full-time privileged faculty. Absolutely. But, in order to but the important that, thing uh, in that UPS strike, and one of the reasons they were so successful is they all went on strike, the yeah. full-time yeah. and the, the part-time. Yeah, you have to, you have to get yeah. that. Respect of the strike line. Yeah, yeah. And, and they also had very good access to their consumers so that they were very well known and liked, right. and that would be parallel to us being in right. good touch with our students and having our students understand exactly why we had to strike if we did and so forth. I think there's a lot of parallels there and a lot we could learn if we were in a position to do something like UPS. They would be the people to learn it from. But Most part-time workers, whether they're state or any other way, are not covered by a union, which limits, which also limits their ability to organize. Um, and that takes us back to the UPS. If the full-time workers were not supportive of the part-time workers, then the strike would not have had the impact that it's having, which, which hopefully it will cause some organizations that specializes in part-time workers to reevaluate their positions. UPS lost $600 million. Harvest of Shame called on American citizens not just to sympathize, but to act. Murrow closed his program by asking his viewers to cultivate an enlightened, aroused, and perhaps angered public opinion to demand a change. Hector Golan asked his viewers to beware of the collusion between agribusiness and government. My question is, have we as a culture, rather than bring the migrant farm worker into the economic mainstream, have we instead begun to marginalize and impoverish new groups of American workers? I feel that I'm doing an important job, and I'm excited about my work, but I don't get the feeling that the administration knows or cares, <laughs> particularly. I mean, they, every so often they, they make a pat on the back of part-timers without whom we couldn't function, but they don't know me as an individual teacher and what I stand for. Our future um, 
uh, depends as much on the future of the regular faculty. I mean, we're not separate. We're not in, in opposition. We're really basically together. And one of the ways they destroy unions is to, you know, divide and conquer. And what we have to recognize in the full-time faculty, you have to recognize, too, that the, the future of education is, is uh, um, has a bearing on, on, on the status of, for both of us. That, that we're going to either hang together or fall. And that's, that's why when the talk about union and the talk about federal standards um, is really important to us as well. When fall term rolled around, their adjunct uh, photo professor, instructor, um, didn't show up. Uh, so they called me the day before classes started and asked me if I could teach a Saturday morning class as an adjunct uh, instructor. And later on, I was talking to the secretaries in the office and asked them uh, what happened to the other guy. And they said, well, we forgot to send him his contract, so he didn't think he was coming back.